brat. My dad was a uh, uh, career army officer. He was, his father was a career army officer. Uh, my mother's father was a, a career army officer. Her grandfather was a career army. It goes back literally to uh, 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 Custer. my Custer stand. Uh, the, at, right after Custer stand at Old Bighorn, my great 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 grandfather was from Ireland. His name was Patrick Kelly. He came over and he joined the army and he wound up serving in the cavalry and he was out in the Dakota Territory and he was uh, in charge, he wound up being a sergeant after a few years and he wound up in charge of a, uh, a cavalry uh, group that uh, did scouting for the main battalion uh, divisions and uh, when they were out in the Dakota Territory uh, fighting the Sioux Indians and other, other tribes out there, defending against them, uh, he was uh, assigned to go find uh, George Armstrong Custer. Colonel Custer and his band of troops uh, had uh, led, led off and were supposed to be out scouting and they didn't come back. And so my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, uh, searched for them up in the Dakota Territory and then finally found them at a place called Little Bighorn. And what he found were the bodies of Custer and his troops uh, who had been massacred by uh, Crazy Horse and a band of Sioux, Sioux and Arapaho Indians. Uh, they buried them there and, and so forth. My, uh, my uh, great-great-grandfather buried what was left of the uh, bodies they found left by the Sioux Indians, uh, and that was that was the beginning of my uh, my army bloodline. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I decided to go in the Navy and Navy ROTC at UT. Uh, I was in it for uh, my freshman year. I also joined the Naval Reserve uh, and went to Naval Reserve meetings down on Barton Springs Road at the old Naval Reserve Center, which is now a municipal theater. Uh, and uh, the idea was that by being in the reserves, I would generate uh, time in service so that when I graduated and was commissioned, I'd have four years of service for pay purposes, right? Because if I didn't do that, I'd, st I'd be starting from zero when I was commissioned. Uh, so I joined the Naval Reserve. Well, I was doing fine in school. Uh, I was in Navy ROTC. I was on the Navy drill team, the Buccaneers. Uh, I played freshman baseball at UT. I tried to be in a fraternity, Kappa Sigma. Uh, but there were some classes I just couldn't work into my schedule. <laughs> I was busy. So after my uh, spring semester, the dean, Margaret Berry, who lived here for a number of years, some of you may know, may have known Margaret Berry, got together and decided that I needed a break from the rigors of academia. <laughs> they called it enforced academic withdrawal. <clears throat> so I was out of school after, uh, right after my freshman year at UT. Uh, I, I, I didn't want to get drafted into the Army because Vietnam was kicking up and I thought, I'm not going there. My dad had touched Vietnam a few times when he was in we lived on the island of Okinawa, and he was in the Army Special Forces, and they went into Vietnam a few times in Laos training uh, uh, troops, local troops. And I thought, no, I'm not doing that. So I went, I went into the Navy Reserve uh, and uh, stayed in the Navy Reserve for a couple of years, did a uh, one on active duty with the Navy, uh, as a naval reservist, uh, made a couple of West Pacific cruises, West Pac cruises on a destroyer, and got into went through sonar school. I was an underwater submarine detector, sonar technician, and uh, came back, and then got orders for a naval reserve training ship, the USS Marsh, a little destroyer escort uh, uh, based in Long Beach, and I was on that for a while. Uh, and, and we just got underway like once a month when our reserve crew came aboard. There were a bunch of naval reservists who would come aboard and then we'd 
we'd, we'd go sit down and let them take the ship over and get underway for a weekend and then they'd bring it back into Long Beach and then they'd leave and we'd take the ship over again but we didn't we stayed right there and that wasn't too bad but then one of my buddies one of my partners on the ship I was a sonar tech he was a radar when we were both in the same division uh, got orders from Vietnam uh, he his wife had just had a baby uh, and he was he was pretty troubled because he had a brand new son and he got orders for Vietnam for a year. And so we worked out a swap, which you could do then. I don't know if you still can or not. But we were the same, we were both E5s, E4s then, I'm sorry, E4s. I was a petty officer third class and so was he. Uh, so we got permission and I, we did a swap. He stayed on the marsh and I went in his place to Vietnam. Uh, I wound up going out there to Mobile Riverine Force, which was just really building up in the southern part of South Vietnam, in the in the Mekong Delta region of the of the country. Uh, jungles, the Mekong River, which is the main one, huge <laughs> Mississippi size, and then lots of tributaries and smaller rivers. And the Navy was just developing its mobile riverine fleet, uh, and they, they had uh, PBRs, patrol boat rivers. Uh, they were small, 30, 31 foot, there were two different classes of them. Gunboats, river gunboats, fiberglass, uh, they only drew about uh, three feet of water, so they weren't that deep. They ran on, uh, uh, powerful water jet engines. Uh, they were made. They could they could patrol rivers and water up to three up to only three feet in depth without having any problems. I mean, they were made for that area. Uh, we went through training before we went to Vietnam in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, to get just to get to, uh, oriented on the idea. Uh, so I wound up uh, on the uh, on the on the Mobile Riverine Force uh, in 1966. Uh, the PBRs were armed with twin 50 caliber machine guns mounted in the turret near the, near the bow. They were small. We only had a crew of four people, sometimes five. Uh, one engineer. Uh, who, who usually stayed down near the engine, which was below deck, but there wasn't an engine room. It was just a place where the engine was below the below the main deck. And these things were like the size of a pretty good uh, a yacht. You might see out on Lake Travis. Uh, so they had twin 50 caliber machine guns mounted in the bow, and one 30 caliber machine gun near the stern on the back of the ship. And usually an M60 machine gun and maybe an M18 uh, automatic grenade launcher up in the control area. And two or three of us would stand up there. So, uh, there was one chair. And that's where the, the, uh, the wheel was to steer the boat. Uh, and crew members generally carried or had with them M16 rifles and 45 caliber pistols. In Vietnam, the river patrol generally operated in two boat sections, and very, very often there would be two, at least two sections that would operate with each other, so you'd have a total of four boats. Uh, our primary purpose of river patrol was to stop and inspect small boats, uh, sandpans and junks that were up and down the rivers. And the south part of Vietnam from, from uh, Saigon south is mostly water and jungle, but it's just, it's, it's filled with water, waterways. Uh, it was, was, it had, had tons and tons of these small, uh, I mean, that was the main me method of transportation for the people of, of that part of Vietnam. And the population of that part of Vietnam was uh, uh, about half of the country's South Vietnam's population was down in the Delta area. Uh, we would uh, 
pull the boats over or pull up next to them and search them to make sure they weren't carrying weapons, ammunition, or any kind of other dangerous contraband that could go to the enemy and, and become dangerous to American troops. Uh, we would also check identity papers uh, uh, for them, which they all had, uh, issued by the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese government, uh, to make sure they were legitimate and that they weren't um, uh, Viet Cong infiltrators or North Vietnamese infiltrators. Uh, and there was generally a curfew, an actual curfew across the country, across that part of the country from 8 p.m. until 6, 6 a.m. Uh, they didn't, the, the idea was to, to uh, deter nighttime boat movement because nighttime mo boat movement pretty much was either troop carrying enemy troops or munitions or guns or that sort of thing. And so we, we tried to uh, uh, prevent that. So there was a, a curfew from 8 p.m. at night until 6 a.m. the next morning. And our job, part of our job was to enforce that curfew. So we'd cruise a little bit a lot of times, our boats would, and our squadron, to enforce that curfew. And any, any boats in the rivers after that time were very suspicious, pulled over and searched carefully. Our boats operated, they were 31 foot fiberglass motor boats, basically. Uh, they would operate near the middle of the waterways to lower the chances of ambush from the shores. Because the shores were pretty much, most of the shores were covered with jungle. And in a lot of the places, you could, you literally could not see. All you could see were greenery uh, along the banks on both sides. Growing up, uh, there was there was no way to know, you know, that you could see through there. And so uh, the uh, uh, the enemy could come right up to the waterway, hide in the greenery, hide behind trees and everything, and and attack take take uh, artillery shots or rifle shots or machine guns to passing boats and so forth. Uh, so when we, uh, when we would approach a Vietnamese watercraft, a boat, whether it was small, medium sized, large, uh, usually uh, uh, two of us, uh, one of the PR, one of the PBRs, would actually approach the boat, and, and a couple of our sailors, a couple of our crew of two or four, sometimes we'd have a South Vietnamese sailor with us, would get on the the uh, boat and search it just to make sure. the The second boat would be the standoff boat, and they would they would be 50 to 100 feet, sometimes further back covering the scene with their guns, also scouting the shore to make sure that nothing happened while we were messing with the little boat, make, make, make sure we didn't, weren't attacked. Uh, on at least one occasion, and, and many more, our, our boats would come under fire from deep cover. Uh, the, sometimes the rockets, they would fire rockets at us. Uh, sometimes, uh, they, uh, I, don't, I, th I think they were Russian uh, weapons, but like bazookas, sometimes they were ro small shoulder-mounted rocket launchers. Uh, and occasionally those rockets would actually pierce the hull of the boat of our PBRs, because again, they were plastic. Now it was thick, but it was still plastic. Uh, so it would float very nicely and it didn't draw a lot of water. It didn't sit very deep in the water, but it was plastic. Uh, but occasionally those rockets would pierce the hull of the boat, killing some of the crewmen down, down below and, and blow a hole in the side of the boat and occasionally it would cause them to sink, just to turn <laughs> over and sink. Uh, that happened in, to, to my pair of boats one time. We, our, our lead boat, we were the follow boat, and we would follow 
as we patrol up the river, we would follow behind and to one side, usually the port side, the left side of, of the boat leading the deal. We'd be about 100 yards back. Uh, the lead boat took a rocket round through the hull. It exploded and the boat almost stopped immediately and started to list very heavily. We were up ahead so we circled back around and came up on the outside toward the middle of the river uh, to help them get, get their crew off and, and equipment, weapons, the machine guns they had and any weapons any other equipment we could save. Uh, and when we did that, we went down into the engine compartment and the engineman who was down there at the time was killed by the rocket. It, it exploded, detonated down in the engine compartment and he was killed. We took his body back with us. Uh, then we got the hell out of there, uh, moving off in the direction of the rocket fire away from the direction of the rocket fire, because we were just a single boat then. Uh, took them back to, the, to our base at Dong Tam. Dong Tam was, a, was a, a fishing, had been a fishing village in South Vietnam on the Mekong River, which was at the head of a whole bunch of smaller rivers and outlets. Uh, and that's where we set up our base in Dong Tam. Uh, it became very large after time and it, it was not only uh, populated by our river boats but even larger craft. In fact some L old LSTs, big landing ships, uh, which would carry supplies and so forth up and down the major rivers, uh, they would be based there. So we, we went back to Dong Tam with, with the crew from the wounded, from the from the sunken boat, and all of that, um, and and the next day, a couple of days later, we were off off again uh, on another mission with a, with another boat, and that crew, uh, those that weren't, weren't hurt, were reassigned to other boats and so forth, and kept going. <coughs> We also dropped off Army and Marine Corps sniper teams in different parts of the river and sometimes in some of the smaller estuaries that came off the major Mekong River. I wish I had a map to show you, but I don't, uh, of the Mekong River area. Uh, there were lots of little smaller rivers uh, off the, the main river. So we would drop off uh, Marine and, and Army sniper teams, usually two two people, uh, one who was sort of designated to be the, the sniper, uh, was an expert rifle rifleman, uh, the other would guard him, protect him and so forth, and could back him up if he got hurt. Uh, we would drop them off uh, and they would go on their missions and they had missions of, of going up into the hills to pick off leaders of the enemy, uh, small patrols. I mean, they had they had their orders, and our job was just to drop them off. Then we come back in a day or two days and pick them up and take them back. Uh, occasionally, we'd uh, drop off special operations patrols uh, of different kinds to and then come back. With a pre, on a prearranged date and time to pick them up and take them somewhere else, that sort of thing. Uh, as I said, the Mobile Riverine Force was centered in, in, in Dong Tam, uh, south of Saigon. Our mission was to patrol the base and riverways. We frequently operated, as I said, from, uh, from LSTs. Over time, more of them were uh, stationed with us, and then eventually, they became sort of the motherships for us, and sometimes when we would go further down the river and couldn't, we wouldn't make it back to our base at night, uh, the LSTs would be our, our home, uh, and we'd patrol and then come back to the LSTs and tie up to them uh, and spend the night aboard the LSTs. Uh, LSTs, I don't know if, if, if uh, a 
lot of you guys know what they look like, but they were big long ships that, that had bow doors and they go back to World War II. LSTs were, were used uh, a lot to, uh, like the landings at Normandy, they would go right up to the beach at Normandy and the bow doors would open and troops would storm <laughs> out, like that sort of thing. So they were fairly shallow draft and they worked in the river. But they were big, long cargo ships, basically, so they had a lot of room. Uh, and they could carry spare parts and ammunition and so forth for us. Uh, and they became sort of our moving headquarters, and we'd go out for a two or three day patrol on an LST and then come back to Dong Tam. Uh, the rivers were the main transportation arteries for that part of Vietnam, for southern Vietnam, almost everything south of Saigon. Yeah. Were the LSTs bulletproof? No. I mean, they were steel. They were big, heavy steel ships. So if, if they were, if, if bullets were fired and hit the hull, it wouldn't, it probably wouldn't break through because they were, you know, pretty thick steel. Okay. But they had, a, you know, they had a full crew and all of that. And they had gun mounts, a few. I mean, they weren't heavily armed. Uh, but they would stay generally toward the middle of the river because they were bigger ships. And the rivers there are, you know, there's some depth, but they, th there are lots of shallow places too, and you always had to be careful. Uh, in a bigger ship, uh, they would use their radar and sonar to make sure they didn't run aground or that sort of thing. But LSTs were fairly shallow drafts, so they, were, they worked on the river. Uh, in December 1965, the U.S. Navy launched Operation Game Warden, uh, establishing the River Patrol Force to cover the Mekong River Delta in what was called the Rungsat Special Zone, R-U-N-G-S-A-T, Rungsat Special Zone. In that area, again, boat crews would stop and search sampans and other boats to see if they were transporting guerrilla troops or smuggling weapons or other military provisions to the area. As, as the war churned up and more and more happened in the south part of the country, uh, there was more military activity uh, for us to deal with. We also occasionally had air support from Navy and Marine Corps attack helicopters. Uh, based, they were based nearby in Bung Tau, B-U-N-G-T-A-U, Bung Tau. Bung Tau was the original, in fact, coastal base for the Marine Riverine Force before it moved to Dong Tam, where, where we were, uh, in the upper Mekong Delta. Uh, and so occasionally we would have helicopters flying over us, and if there were some sort of, I mean, based on intelligence and, and uh, so forth, if there were uh, military forces, enemy military forces, they could, they could, they had machine guns and so forth, and they could also protect us. If we were attacked, they could attack from up above. They could respond. Uh, so that, that's basically what I did in Vietnam for, and it was a one year tour. Uh, my time in Vietnam included many hours of boredom, punctuated by short, periods of excitement, and occasionally outright terror. Uh, I mean, when people are shooting at you, it's, I, for those of you who've been in combat, you know what I'm talking about, it's a little scary. Uh, but, I, but I made it home. But with only two weeks left on my one year tour, I had two weeks left on my tour, uh, I, was, uh, I was actually wounded, injured. Uh, but it didn't happen out on patrol, or while searching a sampan or in a firefight. It happened one night in our camp. Uh, I was actually sitting in the latrine <laughs> reading, a, reading a magazine when I heard this whomp, whomp, whomp sound, which was mortar fire being launched into our camp. Sappers, as we call them, uh, Vietnamese or uh, uh, Vietnamese troops uh, or uh, Viet Cong would come in, sneak up right outside the fences of our base, 
set up mortars and just lob shells in at night uh, and try to hit things and they'd lob a few and then they'd grab their mortars and run like hell back into the jungle. And they did it just to harass us and if they could kill anybody or blow something up, great. You know, it was a big deal. But they did it as a harassment tactic. Well, I was in the latrine and I thought, I ain't dying on the pot. <laughs> this ain't happening. So I got up, cleaned up, pulled my pants up, got out and ran. I was running back for my Quonset hut to get my helmet and crawl into our, uh, our uh, burrow uh, with uh, beanbag lining, sandbag line trench and all of that. Uh, but just as I was running by one Quonset hut on my way back to mine, not where I, my stuff was, uh, one of the shells hit it and it, it and exploded a little bit. I didn't even slow down. I was moving. <laughs> I, I, was I kept going. Uh, I, I got back to my Quonset, grabbed my helmet, got into our trench, and it, after the the attack was over. My buddies and I were getting up and cleaning ourselves off and one of my pals looked at my knees and said, oh my God, look, you've been hit. And I looked down and both my knees were bleeding. I thought, oh my God, I didn't even feel it. And then I started feeling it, uh, <laughs> big time. Uh, one of the hospital corpsmen in our unit cleaned up the wounds. Uh, and gave me painkillers and so forth, uh, and you know I was I was okay, but I was out of out of commission for for a bit. Uh, within a day or so, I had been transferred. I had at this this happened when I had two weeks left on my one year tour. <laughs> I, I could have done it when I had just gotten there for two weeks, but no, I did the one year, then I got hit. Uh, so uh, I, I went to, uh, they sent me to, uh, after the, the cleanup uh, medical procedure there on the base, uh, I was sent to the Philippines, uh, to the Naval Hospital at, at uh, Manila. And they, uh, they did emergency surgery and check the tendons and the ligaments to make sure that nothing was torn and I could still walk and all of that. And then within a, uh, a week, I was transferred back to the Naval Hospital at Pearl Harbor, and they performed surgery to stitch the muscles and tendons and ligaments up and make sure everything was fine. Uh, and eventually, after a little uh, uh, rehabilitation there, I was sent back to Long Beach where I had been before Vietnam, and I wound up back aboard the USS Marsh, the destroyer escort, my reserve training ship. Uh, and I finished my active duty in the summer of 1968, uh, which was an interesting time that a lot of you remember, uh, dealing with the war. Uh, I headed up to the Bay Area of San Francisco my dad had finished, uh, retired from the Army after 30 years. We moved to Austin when I was in high school. I graduated from St. Edwards High School. I was just here my senior year. Uh, he was teaching, he had finished his doctorate at UT, taught at UT San Antonio when it was first opening, and then went out to University, University of the Pacific in Stockton, California, which is about 70 or 80 miles east of San Francisco, the Bay Area, between San Francisco and Sacramento. And he was teaching at that school. Uh, I didn't, I wanted to go to college, but he'd go back to school, but I didn't want to be in the same town with my folks, because I loved them dearly, but I didn't want my mom knocking on my door every morning, you know, to say, how, what are you doing? You yeah, know, are you up? Are you going to school? Are you, how's your study? You know, that kind of stuff. So I stayed, I went to the Bay Area, I went, I went to the University of San Francisco, San Francisco State for one year. Uh, I was close, I could go visit them, but uh, mom didn't knock on my door every morning, so it worked out fine. 
Then I transferred back to UT uh, the next fall, in the fall of 69, majored in journalism, Daily Texan mainly. I was the editorial page editor for the Daily Texan for a couple of years. I wrote editorials and all of that. Got to know Frank Irwin. I don't know if any of you remember him. He was the chairman of the Board of Regents. And uh, we uh, didn't get along too well because I was critical of him. Nobody got along with him very well. Boy, that's right. <laughs> In fact, I'll, I'll tell you this story, and I won't, I'm, I'm about finished. I met, I met him, actually. My editor, my student editor, a fellow named Mark Morrison from Houston, so he said, you got to meet Chairman Irwin, Chairman Frank Irwin. I said, why? Why would I want to meet him? He said, you need to meet him. So he took me over to, uh, Irwin would meet every week. He would go over to the, the 40 Acres Club. I don't know if any of you remember that, but it was right across the street from the university campus. Uh, and it was, a, it was a cocktail lounge and all of that, but it was a, so pretty much a 40 uh, faculty place. Well, he would meet, he would go there in the afternoon into the bar and hold forth. And generally, uh, apparently a lot of the student politicians would, would go over with him and sit like, you know, uh, servants in front of him and listen to him talk which he did with no problem. Uh, so well, anyway, Mark Morrison took me over there and we walked into the 40 Acres Club and sat down and there was Chairman Irwin holding forth with a group of student politicians. Uh, and uh, eventually Mark said, uh, Mr. Chairman, I wanted you to meet Dave Helfert. Uh, I know Dave has written some editorials that were critical of some of your activities as Chairman of the Board of Regents, but I wanted you to meet him face to face. Irwin looked at me and said, and excuse my language, Helford, that's the way he talked, you dumbass, let me tell you something. And that was how I met the chairman of the board of regents. Helford, you dumbass. <laughs> so uh, that, uh, but I actually finished in journalism. Uh, I went to work at uh, KTAP Radio in Austin. Uh, I don't. I don't think it exists anymore. K, it was KHFI FM KTAP AM, and it had disc jockeys like Ed Brandon, uh, it, you know, who was also on channel them channel 42, uh, and Mel Pennington, people like that back in the day. Uh, I was there for a little over a year while well, I was still in school. I finished my journalism degree. Then I went to work at KBUE, Channel 24, when it first went on the air in 1971. And I was there for three years. I covered City Hall mainly. I was a reporter and a weekend news anchor and so forth. Richard Goodman was our news director and, and my anchor, if any of you remember Richard Goodman. Uh, and then after three years at KBU, I left and went to work at the Texas House of Representatives as media services director, basically public information officer. All 150 members of the Texas House had their own staff, but they only had two people on their staff, usually a secretary and an and a, uh, administrative assistant or a legislative assistant. Uh, we would help, on my, in my department, we had two full-time photographers who would go up and take pictures on the floor of the House during sessions and in committee meetings and take pictures of the members and the people testifying. And then the members and their staffs could come down and go through those pictures and pull them out to use in sending newsletters out or press releases, that sort of thing. Uh, we also, I wrote press releases for the members if, if their staff couldn't do that, that sort of thing. So we were their public information office. Uh, and that, I, I did that for three years and then went into business uh, as, in, in, as a partner in an ad agency here in Austin, KHZ, Corbett Hilfer and Zabel. We did advertising for, geez, eight years. Hennessy Chevrolet, if any of you remember Hennessy Chevrolet back in the day, we did Hennessy Chevrolet and a bunch of other businesses like that. So, anyway, that's my story. Uh, that was my adventure in Vietnam. Uh, 
like most things I do, it wasn't on purpose. It wasn't carefully thought out or pre-planned. It just happened. I, I got a little messed up during it, but I survived it. Uh, I guess you can't expect too much more than that, especially in a messy war like that. So that's it. Any questions at all? David? Yes. When you would pull over to some of these sand pans, yeah. that sort of thing, if you pulled over and you did find weapons, what was the procedure? Because obviously those are bad guys. Yeah, yeah, they would be. And, and a lot of times they were bad guys, and a lot of times they were forced into it. Okay. I mean, the, 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 most of the people on those boats were, were basically fishermen. Fisher families. I mean, they usually had their whole families on board, uh, and they were forced into yeah. doing that. Some, sometimes not. Sometimes they were bad guys, uh, but we would we would tow them back with us to our camp, where they would be questioned and so forth. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have to do you know question them, so I didn't you know get into what you know how if they were found guilty or not. Yeah. What happened to uh, the man that you exchanged places with so he could stay with his now 60-something-year-old son? <laughs> <laughs> he was, he stayed aboard, he was, he had stayed aboard the USS Marsh uh, and uh, uh, left while I was overseas, got, got, uh, got transferred to another ship. But he, he, he was there when his wife, was, you know, when he had a little, a brand new baby. So you lost school. track of him? Well, uh, I, over the years, but, you know, we, we stayed in touch just by mail and so forth after that. But not too much in Vietnam. I mean, I wasn't, yeah. uh, I wasn't a great correspondent. Yeah, in, I didn't spend a lot of time <laughs> writing letters. In the sun, do you know anything about what happened to the sun? I do not. I do not. I, I totally lost touch with him after that. Yeah, okay. I think his name should have been David. What? I think his name should have been David. Yeah. Or stupid. Yeah. Yes. Okay. What does LST stand for? Landing ship tank. Okay. They were originally built during, I think, during World War II, to for landings, uh, particularly in like the ones that are most famous were in Europe uh, along the French beaches and so forth. And they had huge bow doors. They could carry armored vehicles like tanks. They'd pull right up to the beach, put down a ramp, and the tanks could roll off and so forth through the bow doors onto the beach and, you know, into battle. So landing ship tanks. Okay. So they had been around for a while. Almost every, all the ships in Vietnam in that era had been around for a while. Most of them were World War II uh, variety. The, the, the destroyer escort I was on back in Long Beach was a World War II destroyer escort uh, that had been in the Atlantic during World War II. Most of the destroyers, there were some new ones being, starting to be built that were more modern, modernized, had more sophisticated radar equipment and sonar equipment underwater. Uh, electronic equipment for submarine detection. Uh, but a lot of them were still, and a lot of the boats, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff in Vietnam was, uh, was old, was World War II and Korean War vintage. Uh, there wasn't much brand new for that war. One more quick question. Sure. Was your family terribly disappointed because you wouldn't go into the Army and you chose the Navy? If they were, they didn't communicate it too, too much. That was nice. Uh, Dad, was, Dad was proud that I was in Navy ROTC and I was a young midshipman and I wore my dress whites and, you know, with my shoulder boards and I was on the drill team, you know, like that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know Mom's father. Mom, my mother, whose father was also an Army officer. I don't know. They were disappointed. They, never, they didn't express that to me, thank goodness. Survival counts. Yes, sir. Yes, it does. Um, Just a second. Out of curiosity, uh, 
having toured the Mekong Delta, um, there were market ships that you could buy fruits and vegetables. Were, were they there when you were? Not very much. I mean, there, there, weren't, that many, there weren't that many customers. At that, during that time, I mean, the the the, uh, the waterways were pretty much battle zones, and so other than just being transportation, because they, those were the roadways, there weren't highways. Uh, there were a few windy roads through the delta, but not very much. Most of the, I mean, the the Mekong, for example, was like I-35. Uh, most of them were very very uh, careful. Uh, so they didn't, uh, they, they stayed close to home. Yes? Paul and Cronkite, late in the war, uh, visited Vietnam, talked to a bunch of military and civilian people there, and came back with the conclusion that the war wasn't winnable. I wonder, I was probably, uh, after you were there, I was wondering if there was any discussion of can we win this fight or not during the period when you were there. Well, the question was the war winnable. I mean, that was that, as he was saying Walter Cronkite on the news <coughs> went over to Vietnam and came back and said, in his judgment, the war was not winnable in Vietnam. And I think most people agreed with him. It, it I think it really boiled down to a question of what does <coughs> winnable mean. I mean, when you're when you're when you're fighting an enemy that is part of the people of that country. I mean, it wasn't like World War II where you had the Germans coming in or the Japanese coming into other countries. These were Vietnamese people who were fighting us. Um, it makes it a lot more difficult to say we've won because they still, that's still their country. Uh, and, and because they were, they could just disappear into the country and their villages and towns and so forth uh, and, and melt back into the population, you never knew for sure whether you, you know, got them or not. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think a lot of us thought, eh, you know, if we can just get them to back off us and we can get out of here and do our one year of service and, you know, leave breathing, you know, then pumping pump blood, we're That'll be good. That's all the winning we need. Yes? How were you treated as a Vietnam vet when you came back to America by the population? It, what it, was the question? How, how were we treated? How was I treated as a Vietnam vet back in this country? Because I came back in 1968. <laughs> I went to school at San Francisco State in 1968. I don't know. You guys are all kids, but your parents may have told you that 1968 was the year of the Black Panther movement in in uh, across the river, uh, and uh, uh, the anti-war movement really, 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 really kicked up. And San Francisco was one of the hearts of the anti-war movement. There were all kinds of protests and demonstrations in the Bay Area. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, I mean, we felt real defensive and kind of like, holy crap, I mean, we just got back from being at war and, you know, you're treating us like this. Uh, but a lot of people were very appreciative, too, of the service. Uh, and uh, back in Austin, uh, but less of the anti-war sentiment. It wasn't. It wasn't as militant as the Bay Area was in 1968. Uh, I mean, that was the time of the black. As I said, the Black Panthers and the, what was the anti-war group, the SDS and all that really got going. Yeah. Uh, so it was. You were a member of SDS like me. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, didn't pay my dues into that. I was just trying to stay in school and. Stay the heck out of trouble uh, as, as much as I could. Did, and, you, uh, did you have any interaction at all with some of the, the non-contributing uh, members of Vietnam or some of the families or anything? Any of the, the non-warlike uh, people? In Vietnam? 
Yeah. Yeah, occasionally, sure. Sure. I mean, we when we'd cruise rivers, we'd stop at villages and things like that. And most of the people were very peaceful and 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 even welcoming. I mean, they were cordial at least. Uh, I mean, they didn't love us and hug us and that sort of thing because they, you know, they probably had some, <coughs> some, some people on the other side as part of their tribe or watching them or they were worried yeah. that that would happen. But, but they were cordial. Uh, in the cities, much more so, uh, because a lot in the cities, like Saigon particularly, a lot of the city depended on the U.S. for its money, you know, for us spending money and so forth. Uh, both the soldiers and sailors on and Marines on leave and liberty, but uh, just the, the expenditure and everything uh, was a major, major, major part of the economy. Uh, but in the in the villages. Most of the people were cordial, uh, to say the least. When they realized we were not there to hurt them, move them, make them do something, go somewhere else, yeah. you know, that sort of thing, they, they kind of backed off and, and were okay with us. Any other questions? I was just, in retrospect, were you glad you made the swap, swap with your buddy? Yeah. Uh, in a word, no. You would rather stay in this Yeah, I mean, I gave up uh, being uh, an e E4 and, th and then ultimately an E5 on a reserve training ship in Long Beach, California, where I could live ashore in an apartment and drive into work every day and then go home at night, you know except on the days when I had duty and then I'd have to sleep over on the ship. I mean, it was a tough life on that ship. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I had to give that up to go. But, you know, I, I, it's, at the time it seemed like the right thing to do. My buddy, you know, his wife had just had a baby and he was, you know, he was in danger of, of going off for, for a year and, and being in combat. Uh, with a new baby, a new son, so it just seemed like the right thing to do. So I, you know, did I enjoy it? Not so much. <laughs> no, no, I did not enjoy it, but you get used to it, and you just, you know, you find ways to put up with it. And, I mean, if any of you guys have been in combat, you know what I'm talking about. You do what you have to do. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. 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 Thank you.